Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Why hello, Podmanity. My name is Eric, and I'm here with Michael. Yeah, we're here. And as always, we're going to do two movies today on some sort of... I guess what this is, is learning about uh, the cinema of the olden day uh-huh. without actually forcing anyone to watch those movies. Right. Because they're really old. Sure, it's, it's a way of getting around doing remakes and covering old material. Yes, I like it. So what are the movies? Uh, we're going to do Ed Wood and Shadow of the Vampire. So I think everyone gets what's going on here. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. But uh, if you aren't aware of either of the the filmmakers, or I guess the movie we're talking about, Edward D. Wood Jr. Mm -hmm. made uh, probably some of the worst movies of all time. He was voted the world's worst director in 1980. (laughs) Well, and also, uh, I believe the the movie said, what, two years after his death? Two years after his death, yeah. That's, man, still a fresh corpse at that point. Um, but somebody you need to know about, mm. especially on a show like Double Feature. Yep. I'm amazed we haven't covered uh, Edward D. Wood Jr. at this point. We'll see how long I can keep up saying his full name. As I I'm bet sure it's sure he would have loved. It, you're done. The other film is Nosferatu. Yes. I think we might be able to legitimately do a show about Nosferatu, but it'd be really hard to convince an audience. You've either seen Nosferatu or you're not interested. Right. In, but you can't be talked into that. Pretty much. Maybe if it were Halloween. I think that might I, be the only I'd opportunity. I'd be less likely. To, if I'm going to watch a horror movie on Halloween, it won't be Nosferatu. Yeah. That's the movie that should be leading the Music Box Massacre every year. That's right about where that movie is. Yep. And fuck it. We're going to get to talk about it anyways because we're talking about Shadow of the Vampire. Mm-hmm. So we might not just spoil two movies today but maybe even four movies or we could spoil up to and including seven movies today that's a lot of goddamn movies so you can skip over the movies you haven't seen or the movies we might be discussing within those conversations by using the chapters um other things that'll probably be really heavy on the show is uh and and this is some more great didn't anticipate this in the double feature stuff tor johnson but we're that wasn't what I was thinking. Oh, I sorry. was thinking alternate fiction oh. or uh, alternate history, historical fiction, secret history, that kind of stuff. Because that comes up in both movies. Yeah, it does. To one extent or the other. We can kind of talk about how those are different. But uh, we also have a show of morphine and vampires today. Morphine and vampires. I can't wait. Let's uh, get right to it. The first one then would be Ed Wood. Yes. Which I guess is mostly true. Especially comparatively. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I don't know if I'm going to blame that on my ignorance of Nosferatu or the fact I don't believe in vampires. There may be audience members that disagree with us. Uh-huh. Double feature show at gmail.com. Yeah. But I think Ed Wood gets the story mostly right, even in the areas like the relationship with Bella Lugosi. That mm-hmm. could be a little tricky because yeah. no one really knows you know, what went on there. And the movie kind of plays, it shows you a little bit of both sides of both kind of the exploitation side and the friendship side, the, how it might've happened side that, you know, you know, there's no coming away from this movie, not knowing what's truth or fiction. Right. Besides maybe Orson Welles. So I guess, um, you and I have probably seen the exact same Edward D. Wood Jr. Movies. Yeah, that's probably true. They're the staples, I guess. Most of the ones that are covered in mm-hmm. Ed Wood. You had seen Glenn or Glenda before I did. I actually watched it. Uh, I've been meaning to get around to it for a long time yeah. since I found out about Ed Wood. But I never quite did. And then the show was coming up and I thought, you know what? I'll see that. Yeah, that was the first one I saw. Now, you said something really interesting to me. You said, um, I believe you said it was a fucking wreck. Was, yeah. it, was that your... I, I think a train wreck. Yeah. Yeah. And I was only about, so I've been doing this on Netflix, right? Because I've had no goddamn time to watch movies. Uh So I'll do this awful thing that I really hate doing, but I will watch, um, I will watch movies on Netflix on various devices throughout the day. So I'll say, Hey, I have 20 minutes here. I'm going to watch part of this movie. And I try not to do it with movies I actually give a shit about. Right. But movies like Glenn Credit Glenda. movies. Credit movies. I'm not familiar with that concept. Credit movies is a term I use in my own film viewing world. Oh, which I think are, I know where you're going with this. Which are movies that I need to have said I've seen, but I don't actually give a shit about. And I know there's no merit to the film other than kind of having seen them. 
it goes a lot with a lot of the old exploitation that people care about. Because right. a lot of old exploitation that's really popular is bad. Yeah, and when you see, you're still probably going on, what, 300 movies a year or something oh, yeah. like that, right? at least. And so you can't possibly really sit down and give all those movies 100% of your attention. And they don't all deserve it. And so the, the Ed Wood stuff, I mean, a lot of the Ed Wood stuff, you do have a good time sitting down sure. and watching it. You, you have to see it for yourself, as with a lot of the exploitation stuff. You just have to be there while it's happening mm-hmm. so you know the pieces to pick up. Right. And so I thought, all right, well, this movie's already going to be, as you say, a train wreck. I will, uh, I'll watch it in 20-minute increments. That's probably um, harder than just sitting down and watching it all at once. Oh, my God, it was. It's as if I had to watch the movie five different times. And so, Ed Wood, if you, uh, if you cheated and just didn't watch this, uh, this movie, I almost called it a documentary. Can you believe that? If you didn't watch this movie at all, Ed Wood is this director who is, I guess you would say, um, charismatic? I yeah, mean, is eccentric. That the word you, sure, eccentric too. But what I'm getting at, I guess, is that you like him. You really want to like the guy. He's some kind of, you know, hero. He's the underdog. Yeah, right, right. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing cynical or wrong or evil about the man, mm-hmm. at least in his heart, I guess. Right. It seems like he just really loves movie making and he happens to be shit at it. Yep. And so he's this director that went on to make these haphazard sort of randomly assembled movies yeah. that also turn out to be, you know, awful. Sure. You know, you get this idea of Ed Wood, uh, the sort of Plan 9 idea that many of his films are just the, the assemblage of the worst elements. Mm-hmm. That X, Y, and Z things all went, not even to say that, but 20 different things came together and went wrong. Uh-huh. He happened to get Bela Lugosi when the guy was on morphine and dying. Right. He had all of these, you know, he was making up the movies as he goes, right. or he was using pieces of sets he could get. And I think that's true of most of his stuff. But I feel like Glenn or Glenda really just has about one or maybe... I think it's one thing. I think yeah. there's one thing that ruins Glenn or Glenda. Yeah. Are you on the same page? I think so. So what do you think that thing is? The acid trip? Oh my God. Yeah, right? Yeah, there's this weird section in the end half of the film where it you can't really explain what's going on. It's kind of a composite of B-roll I found on the floor. Right, right. And clips of people dressed funny. Sure. But it doesn't really apply to what's been going on in the former half of the film. Well, where you see it in the the perfect example, if you've never sat down and watched Glenn and Glenda, or you know you've never watched someone else's reaction, is the scene where the fucking studio heads are watching mm-hmm. Glenn or Glenda, and they're showing that that goddamn scene, the one that talks about oh, I'm going to say boys, dogs, and snails, because uh-huh. I don't actually want to recite the line. Right. It may it hurts me every time I yeah. hear the phrase because in Glenn or Glenda you hear it a thousand mm-hmm. times. And it's so cringeworthy. And you know, Ed Wood sat down, wrote out that line, and thought it was just awesome. Yep. And Bella Lugosi recited it as if it was that awesome. Yep. And it's really not. And that's the point in the movie where you have this acid trip. It's, I mean, it's okay up to that point. It's kind of, again, the movie's heart's in the right place. Mm -hmm. The science is a little off. (laughs) But it's this movie about transvestites. And it's a really humanistic kind of... It was supposed to be called I Changed My Sex, which they... Right. Which they cover in the film when they touch on this weird, I mean, the kind of film studio you and I love yeah. where the poster comes first yes, and the script and director are, are, are later. And most of the movie's made up of these two guys talking or that's, that's sort of how it's woven together, giving uh, two examples of transvestites, you know, ones that go through operations, ones that just like women's clothes, as it describes Ed Wood as being mm-hmm. uh, completely heterosexual loves banging women yeah, as he says loves sex with women just also loves fuzzy sweaters just doesn't want to get injured in the war and it's something sarah jessica parker's character says during the filming of that talking about um how this isn't real life how you've surrounded yourself with a bunch of weirdos mm-hmm. and i think that's something that led uh, these movies maybe not to get made but to exist as the way they mm-hmm. are because even if something like glenn or glenda was this uh, i don't know cacophony of bad elements that just kind of all fell into the same box and got shaken around and that's yeah. you know the movie you still i mean to write a 20 to 40 minute acid trip i mean you hypothesize that perhaps he didn't have enough yeah movie there yeah. he needed seven it said in the film he needed seven reels which true <laughs> right. or not he needed more film than he had any idea of what to do with but that's another good example of where we don't really know 
why there's a 20 minute acid trip in the middle of the film that makes right. no sense. And then they come back as if it's fine now or why Bella Lugosi is, you know, pouring liquid into random and beakers. pulling the strings. But what the movie does really well is say, well, he has to fill seven canisters. Make of that what you will. You know, you turn, you get his reaction to that. And maybe that's a, it's speculation as to what may have happened. there. Mm-hmm. They go right from that to Bride of the Monster, yeah. which I guess was Bride of the Atom. That sounds like a way better Bride title. Bride of the Atom is such a good, it's such a good title. And also there's kind of the, I like when he's in the studio and he's talking to the studio head. Right. And right. he says, Bride of the, he's just throwing film titles out yeah, right. at this point. Dr. Acula, one of yeah. my favorites. Um, but, I guess that was going to be a TV series, and it just never happens. Ah, bummer. Where Bela Lugosi is some kind of supernatural detective. This still sounds like a great idea. More so now that Bela Lugosi's dead. Is Bela Lugosi dead? I'll ask Bauhaus. Fuck, you beat me to that joke. This is where we really start getting heavy into uh, Jeffrey Jones as Criswell. Although there's a Criswell bit that opens. Mm-hmm. And if you've seen a lot of the Ed Wood movies, there's always these little bits of the amazing uh, Criswell. And in some of the movies, the speeches are lifted nearly verbatim. I I think they're probably all the same generic speech that's given. And that's the sort of, um, it's the Rocky Horror moments of the man with no neck describing how you jump to the left. Right. It's just more inexplicable. Why is this here? Um, Amazement, I'm going to say. It's amazement. But Jeffrey Jones just kind of, I don't, where is this guy? You mean now? Ever. It's it's hard to tell where he is. If he, he, He kind of just pops up in films. Not only does he just pop up in films, but then you forget he was in them. Yeah. With the exception for me, the exception is Beetlejuice. Oh, of course. I always remember Jeffrey Jones in Beetlejuice. Mm -hmm. And in recent years since moving to the city of our current locale. Beautiful Chicago, you mean? Yeah, that's the one. There's that movie with um, the Matthew Broderick. I don't know what you're talking about. There's a movie where Matthew Broderick takes a day off of school. And I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to give it the light of day on our show ever. Still don't know what you're talking about. Right now, but he plays the principal in this film. Uh-huh. And so I've been made aware of that. But like going through my head, you asked me while we were watching Ed Wood where Jeffrey Jones has been. Right. I could come up with four titles and three of them we've already talked about. The fourth was this movie called Mom and Dad Save the World. Oh, sure. I remember um, that. Which I don't remember anything about other than he was in it. Sure. Um, well, that's the opposite of what you're describing. Though. Yeah. There's a movie where you only remember Jeffrey Jones, which is how it should be. By yeah, the way. that really is how it should be. Criswell was fucking fantastic. Uh, I think it was The Tonight Show that mm-hmm. he appeared on. And Johnny he Carson. Made, yeah, right, right. And he made these predictions that were so ludicrous. Um, I mean, Carson was really famous for being a skeptic. James Carson Randi was, was on there yeah. all Johnny the time. Carson. I mean, it was great. Watching those old shows, it's... Ah, no one fucking did it like him. It was really great. And Criswell almost... I can't... He's on this line where he's either fraudulent or he's helping us debunk nonsense. Uh-huh. Because the predictions he makes are so absurd. Everyone knows they're absurd. But then you see people like Ed Wood who go, wow, that's amazing. My next film will be great. Right. You, are you guys hearing this? And no one else colonies is even on, faced. Colonies on Mars. <laughs> yeah, Right. As if someone's delivering him the news sure. right at that moment. Sure. Oh, God, it's beautiful. Hey, just came back from the future. Everybody's going to be flying around in jetpacks. There's another, uh, I guess I'd say a more obscure actor, although we were just having a whole fucking conversation about the uh, the obscurity of Jeffrey Jones. But Juliet Landau, yes. who um, is Loretta King. In she's this Loretta movie. King. I'm fucking in love with her. And I think I might have said this on the show before when I didn't know who she was. But so this is pretty amazing. Now- she was in the Toolbox Murders, uh-huh. and that seems to be popping up in my life it's, all the time. It's for also some bad. Is it bad? It's very I haven't bad. Seen it yet. She also did a voice for uh, Bioshock, mm. which isn't a movie, but really should be. I might regret those words someday, but if it were a movie, it would probably be my favorite goddamn movie of all time. She mm-hmm. does the little sister voices uh-huh. in Bioshock, and then she's in Buffy and some stuff. But she was on our show. Uh, I wish she was on our show, but we saw her in a movie we did on the show called Theodore Rex. That's right. And at the time, if I didn't say it on the show, or I probably cut it because no one had any idea what I was talking about, but there was someone who I believe was extremely attractive in that movie that I kept talking about, Uh and that was her. She played the female dinosaur, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, God, I hope that wasn't the truth. In my head, I remember it being, well, it might just be the female dinosaur, in which case, we're talking way more about Theodore Rex than needs to happen on the show. Now, she's probably in the movie... Because of Martin Landau, who right. plays Bella Lugosi. Who plays Bella Lugosi. So Martin Landau is a he's a seasoned actor along along the lines of uh, that actor uh, Max von Sydow, 
which we see uh, every all the time. Another yeah. guy that just pops up everywhere. And this this is kind of the Martin Landau area. <laughs> sure. Jack Lemon is kind of for some reason he kind of stands out in my head as yeah. another actor that's sure. in the same realm. But Martin Landau um, does an incredible job at playing Bella Lugosi. Yeah, I, I think it's I said amazing. multiple times throughout watching this that he's better at playing <laughs> Bella Lugosi than Bella Lugosi was at that age. Well, and every time I see Bella in anything, I think Martin Landau. You think he was great in Ed Wood? Yeah, <laughs> right, right. As you know, as we we're watching this again today, and Ed Wood's a movie that I, I don't know why this happened, but so few people have seen this, and they really should. They should really see Ed Wood, if for no other reason than a bad education. Sure. Just to go, now sure. I know about Edward D. Wood Jr. I saw the biopic. Well, it's kind of shocking, and, and I know we've kind of covered this director a lot in the past. Not so much recently. Sure. But Ed Wood's directed by Tim Burton. Mm-hmm. Um, if you couldn't tell, Johnny Depp is in it, um, and he's playing one of his three roles, so right. that's how you know. Can I drop something exciting Please on you really quick? Drop the I know I warned bomb. you about this. I plan on the show to talk about 1920s era German expressionism, but not with the Tim Burton movie. Oh, wow. Fancy that. How about that? Yeah, going to save that, but go on. So Tim Burton directed this film. This is the first film where he departed his partnership with Danny Elfman. Yeah, right. Unfortunately, I am entirely different from the typical theater going audience in that they don't actually care that Danny Elfman is doing the music in a film. But for me, Tim Burton is Danny Elfman. There's not a bunch of spirals and purple and weird colors and whimsy because all of that kind of goes into what the film is about. That's in plan nine from outer space. Yeah. It's not in Ed Wood. So you almost feel like this doesn't, uh, this isn't another Tim Burton film, right? Which is good because we complain all the time that there are two, that Tim Burton is just churning out the Tim Burton formula. Yeah. And here we have something uh, that's clearly not the case here. Mm -hmm. So I know I brought this up at the beginning of the show, but this is another one of those interesting spots where you say, is Ed Wood exploiting Bela Lugosi? Are they friends? I mean, the movie ventures to guess that Ed Wood probably would have not had a had a film career at yeah. all if it were not for his crazy random happenstance, uh, you know, stroll by Bela Lugosi. Mm-hmm. I mean, I who's to say if that's true or not? That's impossible to know, of course. But what about that relationship between the two of them? Because there are moments where you feel like that's exploitative, right? Sure, but then my gut says it's not. But well, there's also moments where multiple moments where I always think in my head, if this were me, I would just be like, "Sorry, buddy." Where Bella Lugosi calls up Ed Wood mm. and just asks him to come help and holds a gun to his head. I mean, if this yeah, weren't right. a friendship, uh, if you if I came to your <laughs> sure. apartment and you held a gun to my head, if I didn't know you. Right. I wouldn't stay here. That's I would probably need a new sure. co-host is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. I would, well, that's good because guns aren't allowed in Chicago. Oh, great. So oh, yeah. No there are no there. guns in Chicago. I think they're allowed, but there are no guns in Chicago. We have audio evidence. That that's not even fuck. Has any of that made it on the show, by the way? I don't know. I've... So this is quick side note. So hopefully I won't fucking cut this. But right outside our studio, people get shot all the goddamn Every time. day. Like, I'm not even making that up. I, w- I was about to give our address and then have people Google map it, mm-hmm. but we probably don't need any more attention to or this show area up wearing big targets. Oh fuck! So that's probably never made it on the show because when it happens, you and I look annoyed at each other and then pause and say the thing we just said right. so I can edit that part out exactly. Because really, it's such an inconvenience. And if the person's outside screaming, we have to wait. I know until and they wait die, and wait. or the ambulance shows up and then it's another debacle. The fucking you hear the sirens all the time because yeah. we can't wait. Those for are that people shit. dying sirens. That's right. what's going on. Oh god, especially in those early shows. Those are souls we got... crashing against the rocks. All right. Anyways, so yeah, that's hard to know. I guess I'm just glad that the movie covers both sides of that. You know, Bella Lugosi. He's there for Bella Lugosi. He makes those great pains to go through that friendship, but then he seems to exploit Bella after, you know, after Bella's death. Mm-hmm. Although he says that he thinks that's what Bella would have wanted. Yeah. So maybe he's being well, exploitative and not even knowing. There's that. this magic power that I think he has that keeps surfacing throughout the film mm-hmm. that he can rationalize right. anything that sure. he's doing. It shows it early when he's looking at the B-roll and he makes a whole film out of three scenes of (laughs) B-roll. Right, right. But he just continues to come up with stuff and then rationalize, well, it's okay. The thing that constantly comes up throughout the film is the one-shot takes. Mm -hmm. He shoots a scene, cuts, perfect. Yeah. Well, the dude hit the wall. Well, of course he hit the wall. He hit the wall in real life. (laughs) Sure. It's realism right there. And it's not the fuck it attitude of everyone else. Right. 
And that's another thing I love. That's the thing I wish I could do on our show, and I, I just can't, and it gives me anxiety. You know, we prepare for these shows or whatever. I think you might have a fuck it attitude. I do. But I can't, I, I'm, I have to be prepared, and I'm worried about it, and oh my God, we're talking about Nosferatu today. Someone's got, see, because now people actually listen to the show. Right. I just podcast like you don't, a cowboy. You don't That's... get the goddamn emails, <laughs> is what it is. And you people send me them. The, you forward me some of them. Yeah, but they're just emails of people giving me shit. Because right. if I get Nosferatu wrong, people will make fun of me. Mm-hmm. No one's going to make fun of you. No. But they have this fuck it attitude. And Criswell shows up. And he just goes, ah, you know, it's showbiz. I make this shit up. I don't, I don't give a fuck. And Bella Lugosi, I mean, he so doesn't. He sits in his armchair. He watches himself on TV. Occasionally does morphine and then answers the door for the kids. He sure. doesn't give a fuck. Right. And then the best example of that, maybe not even just in the film, but throughout time, is Vampira. Yeah. Who looks as if she does not give a fuck in her in her entire life. Mm-hmm. She's dull and monotonous, and that's part of her her persona. Is she's talking about these monster movies and she just can't care at all. She's just reciting it as if the time she talked about going on a date with the Wolfman was a boring average thing that happened to her. That's part of her character, but we also see her answer the phone that way. She can't be bothered. She's coming to the party, I guess. I don't know. I'll show up in your movie. I'm not going to talk. She just doesn't yep. have it. So it, it, you know, surrounding himself with these people in the movie that makes it look like Ed Wood totally cares he's not only doing one right. scene because he doesn't give a shit he's doing one scene because it's brilliant it's perfect right. that's the way it should be another thing this film does that i think is is one of the stranger and stronger decisions in doing a biopic about edward d wood jr thank you is that it glorifies the films it shows scenes yeah. from the films that are amusing it kind of it's aware already that ed wood is a cult director yeah and so it can go into the films and show the scenes that people think are fun that people really remember right. from going to see plan nine from going to see bride of the monster and it shows the filming of those scenes and instead of tearing them down and showing how poorly things are done it kind of like shows this band of camaraderie mm-hmm. and how everybody doing it is really into it yeah. and it makes the films look like great accomplishments and right. every time he finishes one you're fin- you're just right alongside and you're glad to see the scripts coming out right right but it totally dematerializes the hype around Ed Wood right it takes Ed Wood, the cult film director, and turns him into just kind of like this mixed up dude who's Almost trying. an accident. Yeah. It highlights the fact that he's failing <laughs> right. every time. Right. And he's not even aware of it. He he's hurt when a few people bring it up, you know? Right. And it shows him just kind of blowing it right. for the entirety of his life, yeah. really. And how he manages to just succeed at blowing it over and over yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. And unapologetically, because he thinks... He Well, no, it's not he thinks. He knows he's doing his best job. Yeah. That's why every scene's perfect. But he's just, it's amazing that a person can continue failing for their entire career. Right. It's rare that you start your career with failure and never stop failing. Yeah. I mean, just more and more. More so every single fucking time. Which is why the movie is so cool because you hear I, Plan 9 especially described as the worst movie ever made. Mm-hmm. Universally. That's just, uh, that might be the tagline on the fucking DVD I think at this is. point. So people watch it uh, almost ironically. They watch it to mock it. Sure. And that's totally fair and deserved. But Ed Wood, the film that we're talking about here, looks at the movies of Ed Wood in the same way that we look at that shit on Double Feature saying, wow, isn't this a wonderful bag of failures? Yeah. Isn't it great how all of these things came together? Wow, look how monumentally they're just completely failing right now. A wrestler, a methadone addict, and a fired TV hostess all come together in one graveyard. Let's see what happens. Yeah, it just doesn't get any better than that. So that's Plan 9, is them coming together in that graveyard. And Plan 9 is treated as the climax Mm -hmm. of this film. And that's a fair spot, I, sure. I guess, to end. Although I think Wood has a lot of really interesting stuff going on after Plan 9. But the movie also had to kind of juggle, you know, in talking about not glorifying this character at all, we're dealing with stuff like the morphine. These moments that could be left out, you know, we could talk about Bella Lugosi like a star, but instead we give a very honest look at, you know, Bella Lugosi wasn't as well known as the other guys he wasn't as celebrated for as long a time right although his merchandise is selling that's well. true um and people you know people on the street didn't know him that well until he started making these movies with mm-hmm. ed wood and then people want his autograph when they're walking around 
but it shows a real side of him where he's addicted to morphine. He's not a champion. He's down on his luck. And I think this movie could have very easily just turned into look at Edward D. Wood Jr.'s fun romps through movie making. Mm-hmm. And instead it showed stuff that was a little more fucked up. Yeah. Like that scene where he commits himself to the, the right. clinic. And it's just showing what's a very monster movie-esque stroll through the hallway, turn and look in his window. And it is kind of terrifying. Yeah, it is. It's got the cheesy music in the background. You know what the, the movie is kind of trying to give you the feel of, um, what it's been talking about this whole time. But still, it feels like you get a genuine horror moment in a way that maybe audiences got with horror movies back then. But now we we laugh at that music. Mm-hmm. We laugh at the the way the camera moves and the actors with too much makeup. Mm-hmm. And now we see that same scene. But in the context of what's going on, we're so used to seeing those scenes that when we see him in the clinic, it's actually a little scary. Yeah. It's actually a little disturbing. And that's awesome. That's awesome that they could pull that off. Mm-hmm. So as you said, the film kind of ends with what I would argue is the high point of Ed Wood's life. Sure, what he'll be remembered for. Which is the scene between the opening credits of Plan 9 and the rest of the film. I think that is the peak of his success and the the point where he felt like he had finally succeeded. Mm -hmm. Because everybody was clapping and people weren't disappointed yet. Right. So it kind of shows the glimmer in his eye of, I finally made it. And then that, I mean, that's the peak. It goes arguably downhill from there yeah his career was i mean it was very strange uh at that point because you see him trying to make money through all these movies or like get money to to throw the movies together you see him meet his idol orson welles which never actually happened but i do want to point out um orson welles the voice of orson welles is not yeah. actually credited in this right, movie but it's more important than vince d'onofrio's kind of weird i don't know if it's a cameo because i don't think he existed as an actor yet whatever he's all right but it's uh maurice LaMarche who does, first of all, I want to say an awesome Orson Welles voice. Because at first, you and I both turned to each other and said, that's that's stock footage or something. That's, um, you know, voice recordings. That's stuff actually taken. But it's, uh, you know his work. He's done voice acting in a billion things um, from our childhoods, probably Looney Tunes. Yeah. Or there was the uh, fucking Pinky Pinky. in the Animaniacs. he's the brain. Right, right. Sorry, but from Pinky in the brain, which we referenced a long time ago on our show. Um, we saw him play Alec Baldwin or heard him play Alec Baldwin in Team America. And then he's been doing lots of stuff for the the Batman show I once evangelized and still think is incredible. Um, just all sorts of Batman stuff throughout time. Most recently, Mr. Freeze in Arkham City. Uh-huh. Just a lot of really cool stuff. But anyways, never met Orson Welles. After Plan 9, that's when he started doing stuff that is more in double feature territory. Right. And is kind of interesting because at this point, now we've covered the popular Ed Wood stuff. We can move into the exploitative Ed Wood stuff in a future date on our show. People have a primer now, so we can start throwing stuff like the Sinister Urge at them yeah. and kind of see, you know, if we could get deeper into that. But he's, he spent this period kind of during the 60s, doing exploitation, mm-hmm. doing Night of the Ghouls, or I guess Sinister Urge kind of borders on when it became more pornography. Right. But, you know, he was also writing, and they didn't even cover him as a writer, but he started doing all these pulp novels, all these mm-hmm. uh, these sex novels. I mean, nearly a hundred of them. He was writing like a fucking madman. And the movies he started doing in the 70s were, I mean, they were just straight up pornography. Pretty much. You know, he did uh, Orgy of the Dead, which he didn't direct, but I mean, it's one of the novels he wrote. Uh-huh. It was made into a movie. Criswell's in it. It feels very Ed Wood. And then, uh, you know, probably as a result of finances, his movies just spiraled yeah. just into how can I make money by getting actors I know naked? Um, stuff like, I think it was called Necromania. I never actually saw it, but that's another really big one from that era. And something I think is such a great tribute to the guy is that even after he died, he still had movies consecutively coming out uh-huh. every couple of years, all the way up until this year. Yeah. I mean, even to the present, you know, because he had so many novels and so many scripts, people are now adapting all of that stuff that he might have thought at the time would never go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Now he's a celebrated guy. He was, um, I think it was a point in the mid 90s where there is what they call, at least, a legal church, the Church of Ed Wood, or Woodism, Uh that was founded. I I don't know how much of that is to be believed, but there's a huge cult following behind this guy. And so now people are taking these films or taking these uh, scripts he wrote and turning them into movies, and then it's kind of cool because you get to credit Edward D. Wood Jr. Mm -hmm. as writing your fucking movie. So Shadow the Vampire is kind of a different take on the same basic idea of Mm -hmm. morphine vampires. 
And that <laughs> I was going to stick with alternate history, okay, but if you want to go fine. morphine no, we'll go and vampires, alternate history. I, there's probably more to say. The thing I've about, still never done morphine. Have you done morphine? No. Yeah, none of the recreational drugs. I just figured we know less about what we're talking about. I've also never sucked blood. You got me there. Please go on. Shadow of the Vampire is a film that kind of it entirely falsifies the making of the film Nosferatu from the 20s. Uh, Nosferatu is a German. It's a German silent film. Mm-hmm. It's essentially a ripoff of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Right, right. Um, because as the movie goes on to describe, they couldn't get the rights. Right. So they said, fuck it. We'll just call them something different. We'll title the movie differently. It'll be fine. Yeah. So what Shadow of the Vampire is, is essentially it's a fictionalized making of Nosferatu mm-hmm. in which the actor, Max Schreck, he plays Count Orlock, but I'm going to call him Nosferatu anyway. He's actually a vampire. In real life, IRL, this guy's a vampire. Was hired in secret to keep the realism of the film. It's all about realism. Sure. Hired a vampire to portray an actor portraying a vampire. That's right. That's, I think, a verbatim line from the film. So here we're dealing with something that completely was not true. Because a lot of people (laughs) depart from this movie and say to themselves, so wait, is the movie trying to tell, is this a biopic about Mm -hmm. how this guy was a vampire? And I think even people of a a supremely skeptical mindset can leave the movie at least confused as to whether or not the movie's trying to tell you that because it plays it so straight. Never does the movie depart from this very serious tone it has, Mm -hmm. um, partially because of John Malkovich. It's almost entirely because of John Malkovich. Just the way he plays that character, which to me is, I mean... John Malkovich in this movie is so funny to me. Yeah. I, is that is that the same for no, you? No, yeah, it is. I, I, I totally know what you mean. Do you He's, think that's intentional? That's no, gotta it's be... just John Malkovich. Yeah. John Malkovich is always in his own world when he's in a movie. He's not aware that there's even a movie being made it's, around him. He, he comes... He's the count, right? He, yeah. He shows up prepared, yeah. and the rest of the actors can say... He could walk onto a set having prepared his lines and the rest of the actors could just like stand there and quote lines from like children's songs. Yeah. Right. And he would just without missing a beat. beat. Yeah. He would exactly exactly where he was. He would say it. He would act the same. He would get all of his cues in the blocking around the room and he would do it as if like there were nobody else there. You know, I think we're in complete. And that's why it works in this movie because he is there to make Nosferatu his magnum opus of a film. Right. And everybody else around him is just kind of collateral. They're just kind of around there to hold booms, which there weren't, but you know, if this were a real movie, uh, they would be holding booms. They hadn't invented a stick with a microphone taped onto it yet. Way to go. 1920s. So once you start talking about alternate history, it makes a little bit more sense. Mm -hmm. You know, we've covered, I mean, a couple things that have fallen into alternate history on the show. Yeah. The big one I remember is Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a movie, I guess it kind of stays within, it it stays a little accurate. Yeah. It takes place in a real world for a while. It argues that it's accurate. Right. Essentially what it does is, is it goes, hey, remember World War II? That was real. This happened then. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And you say, wait a minute. I don't. I don't think that's what actually happened. It hands you World War II and goes, okay, imagine World War II. Now imagine this happened there. Yeah, and it was such a great place to do that. I mean, alternate history is so frequently done in World War II because that's the big thought experiment. That's the cliche of, uh, you know, time travel, kill Hitler, whatever. Ilse Shewolf of the SS. And No, that's not where I was going with that. But yeah, another great example, right? Unbeknownst to anybody, you know, until now, we could never reveal the secret truth of the experiments of... (laughs) Did you have to do that? Oh, I hate you. Owl, baby. Owl. For me, what makes secret history such a cool concept is something we talked about. I guess we should just call loose change alternate history, Mm -hmm. right? Because that would be appropriate for that. That's giving that movie too much fucking credit. I'm going to go back in our own history and pretend that loose change was created as fiction, thusly creating some kind of meta alternate history Where buried Willem inside. Was one of the twin towers. Actual history buried inside meta history. So what we talked about at the time was the, I guess, the sexiness of conspiracy theory mm-hmm. that people like. You know, that's the entire genre of spy thrillers and of these uh, the kind of born ultimatum stuff or that fucking movie Salt. I mean, all of this government secrets and things you're not supposed to know and. JFK and this complete bullshit. But that's why that stuff gets propagated. That's why people believe 
in the moon hoax. Mm-hmm. Not because the evidence is so... Or the Loch Ness so, Monster. <laughs> right. Well, maybe even the Loch Ness Monster could fall under that same thing. It's not that the evidence is so overwhelming. It's that you don't have tree fitty. The Loch Ness Monster is a little bit different because you're thinking, you know, because some people believe in the Loch Ness Monster and some don't. But not everybody knows about the Lake Loch Ness. I gotcha. Right? Yeah. But everyone knows who JFK was. Everybody mm-hmm. knows how he dies. But a small subset of people know how he really died. Right. And by really died, I mean lone gunman, grassy knoll. Right. But an even smaller subset are insane and think the way he really died is by a second gunman. Right. Just like people think we didn't walk on the moon and or then, the loose chain shit. Right. And it all kind of doubles back to there's a there's a stone cutter esque group right. of Freemasons That's it. who are pulling all the strings and we'll never really know and we can't know. But we know. And so what secret history is great for is that it's clearly fiction. It's created as fiction, but it celebrates that feeling. It celebrates the feeling of conspiracy Mm -hmm. in an environment that's safe and okay. It's like sadomasochism. It's not okay to punch someone out on the street, but if you pay them to come over and punch you, that's BDSM and it's all right. Yep. You understand my metaphor. I hope that works for everybody else just as well. When you know it's really good is when it actually pushes totally rational people to the point of confusion. Right. When you make a movie like Shadow of the Vampire and it's done so well and so straight and so completely serious that people walk away going, how much of that was real? Right. I mean, I know he can't be a vampire, but he was an insane person they found living on the street. Who right. Had exactly. A thirst for human blood sure. and burns up in the sunlight. Right. I mean, that's. Completely- yeah, it, it's essentially it's kind of. When it goes to the degree it goes where sunlight kills him after he drinks right, somebody's right. blood, then you just kind of wind back a few scenes and go, okay, well, that was clearly made up. But the fact that he would only act at night and that they had to feed him <laughs> yeah. blood as a salary, th- well, that's probably real because there are weird people in the world. So, I mean, come on, there were weird people in the 20s too. Yeah, and that forces you to, well, and the fact that it's in the 20s. For and some reason, looks like that. For some reason, Romania in the 20s, people just think there could have been vampires there. Sure. You know, Germany in the 20s, well, before, people go, well, back then they had that shit. There were no books, oh, apparently. <laughs> there were no books in the 20s. And before the invention of books, dragons and serpents abounded our nations. It's true. It's the truth. Books scared them away. Burn books. Well, there is that one book that uh, is unexplainable. It just shows up in Hutter's uh, hotel room or mm-hmm. whatever that night. Right. I never got that in Nosferatu. Thank fuck I have John Malkovich narrating the entire movie. I love that. I love that he stands behind that it's camera. It's like director commentary yeah, for that's... Nosferatu that you'll never have. <laughs> yeah, you'll never get to hear that. Just saying, whoa, it looks like the, it looks like the locals have left a, mm-hmm. a book for you. You turn and read it. It says some interesting... I didn't know what it said, yeah. but John Malkovich knows that's, what it said. That's an interesting kind of concept. If you go back to silent films mm-hmm. and the director commentary, instead of being, well, what we were going for here is kind of a scene that contrasted, you know, the lightness of the... Instead, the director's going, now you're walking to the other side of the room because it's cold in, this, in near right. your bed and, right. and it's warmer by the way. It becomes narration, but yeah. that's commentary yeah. because you don't know what the fuck is going on no, <laughs> in you, any given scene. Right, so there is all of these subtle reasons, this uh, rationale. It's cold, that's why he's moving. You don't know that. You have no fucking clue. He just walked across the room. How did that book get there? Oh, I guess they, they put it there because they wanted him to know about From the vampires. night before, duh. And the person to, to perfectly do the good old silent film you know that overacting that we talked about in the music box massacre Mm -hmm. shows that's eddie izzard i mean beautiful i never really got um gustav's performance as hutter when i watched nosferatu i didn't understand the wig the you know the curly hair anything going on the fop outfit i don't even know what to call the outfit it just seemed like maybe because I spend my time watching movies like glenn or glenda Mm -hmm. maybe that's why that came about but i just didn't get it his whole character. And then I see Eddie Izzard doing it. And I understand perfectly. Because right. that just looks that looks right for Eddie yeah. Izzard to do. Yeah, it does. The, the openings, the first time you see him acting, and he's looking around curiously. And it's, you know, it's comedic. And he shivers because it's cold. And mm-hmm. he opens the book. What could the book mean? Mm-hmm. Hmm, I wonder. It's funny that his mannerisms can, can then go back and inform more about Nosferatu right. for me. 
So I told you I wanted to talk about German Expressionism. Yeah, you did. And rather than do that thing that I where do you where you talk I, about German Expressionism. <laughs> no, you're not getting off Most the people that don't easy. know in your free time that like you just don't shut up about that shit. So I'm just kind of surprised that it's taken this long to get on the show. I often make this joke, right? When uh, maybe you're working with a group of people and sports come up. Yes. Now, if you can live enough in a bubble, you never hear about sports because nobody likes sports. Not in Chicago. But it turns sometimes out. Sometimes <laughs> you go outside and there's mobs. Well, that's what I was going to say is if you exit your bubble everyone loves sports literally 100 percent of the people on planet earth love sports it's shocking when you eliminate the the statistical uh, outliers that are you and i so apparently. what you're saying is if you eliminate the people that don't like sports 100 percent of the planet like sports thank you so what i used to do is when people were screaming go black bulls pit hawks whatever go black bear fucking, pit hawk bulls yeah the thing Cubs, with the line the of scrimmage and the, the black bear pit hawk bulls. Yeah, fuck uh, I would just scream, yeah, sports, yay sports, and hope that someone would detect that I know nothing about sports mm-hmm. and don't care but about... But instead, they're just like, yeah, sports! Right. I'm all about those. Right, and then they, they just get more particular. They thought I was just being very broad in my statement, fuck them. But I found that a better metaphor for that is German Expressionism. Yes. I will say to them, it's as if the two of you have been talking about 1920s German Expressionism for the last 20 minutes. That's how little I don't understand which sport uses which ball, the players' names. You're speaking a different language. It's me talking about German expressionism. And usually they can go, wow, you're right. I, we've completely excluded you from this conversation. Yeah. Let's talk about something like, I don't know, cupcakes. A small percentage will just go, fag. That's more commonly what happens. But I'm going to keep this short and as accessible as possible because I don't want to be that asshole who forces someone else to listen to something dull and boring. Right. And I think, although it's laughable to say, I'm, I'm now going to talk about German expressionism and it's going to be lively and entertaining and mm-hmm. awesome, there's a reason I'm interested in it. Not because it's obscure, it makes me feel cool and whatever, because I honestly don't even know that uh-huh. much about it. But, you know, if we look back at our show, I think the most authentic thing we've probably gotten, as close as we've gotten to this, might be M, the Fritz Lang movie. Sure. But it was this era that combined... I mean, it was very much about heavy mood and tone, which are things that, you know, a a part of filmmaking, the the component of filmmaking I probably adore the most, Uh, mood and tone. And if you can accomplish that, I'll go with you through whatever bullshit story you're going to tell me. However bad the actors are, how little talent anybody might have. If Mm -hmm. the mood and tone is right, it makes me feel a certain way that I just, that's what I like about movies. Yes. And I think another piece of it was that there's something under the surface. They were taking these silent movies and so, and that's where a lot of the monster stuff comes in, you know, when we got that stuff in America. It was a, kind of a silly metaphor for other things. It wasn't just because throwing these, these title cards, um, these inner titles at people, yeah. and then saying, here's the part you should feel here, and here's what this love story is about, and here's, oh, uh, this person stole the money. That was a really shallow experience. Right. So if you could put some larger metaphor in there, and just talk about the metaphor, talk about the beast, the monster, and never talk about what was under the surface, Uh then people had something to actually discuss with each other when they left the movie. Sure. So for me, this really embodies... Like sports statistics. (laughs) No, not like fucking sports. So for me, this was uh, the first time in filmmaking where we were really saying something interpretive, something under the surface. People could look at a movie and see different things for it. It could say different things to them. But most of that's bullshit. I like the lighting. I mean, yeah, come on, let's dark. be honest. Uh, I, they had these, you know, and that's what we see in uh, the modern influences is less of the under the surface stuff, but more the aesthetic qualities. You know, if we wanted to really take a look at the best example of German expressionism mm-hmm. we've ever done on the show, it would easily be, I know I made the joke before about Tim Burton, but it would be the nightmare before Christmas. Yes, yeah, for sure. I mean, the visuals, you know, the the stuff that he loves it's the thin frames, that kind of Jack Skellington yep. thin frame, and the um, you know they would often paint these kind of shadows. Right. And so when you look at today's modern minimalism, another design aesthetic I really really like, it's all about these you know the I'm looking around our studio right now, these squares and this simple kind of furniture and everything is being used efficiently. It's almost um, there's something very utilitarian about it. But German Expressionism, I feel, kind of resisted utilitarianism. There's some historical gaps in that Mm -hmm. sentence that I don't even want to address. But the set design was, I mean, it was completely ridiculous. It didn't even make fucking sense. I mean, you look back at these movies, and the term I like uh, quite a bit that's often used to describe this stuff 
is geometrically absurd. Uh-huh. It doesn't make any fucking sense the way it's laid out. It just looks like someone throwing shapes or in the case of Nightmare Before Christmas, the way things kind of uncurled, mm-hmm. they were everything. We're looked talking like about a, the hill. That's what we're talking <laughs> about. in Nightmare Before Christmas, there's the hill and it unfolds. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. And that is expressionism to me. That is that era of German expressionism. It was how everything looked like a time lapse of a tree in the fall the way things moved like that and how that didn't make any sense in the environment. But it's a movie and this is fiction and that's our fucking aesthetic. So people would just deal with it. That was part of the art form. Sure. And if that, you know, if that isn't enough to kind of pique your interest on it, I think the influence is another one of the reasons that's as far back as I understand the influence. But for a while for me, I found a design aesthetic I liked. It was film noir. We talked about a lot more noir stuff earlier on Mm -hmm. the show because I was just going through a period where I was really into studying that stuff. And, you know, to look back even further, what was noir inspired by, whether it was the the Wilder stuff or Alfred Hitchcock drew yeah. a lot from that stuff. And unlike the modern equivalents of noir that very clearly look, you can see exactly what they're pulling. The noir equivalents of German expressionism, they don't look the same at all. No. They don't feel the same. They just kind of picked up what was important to that movement and maybe a couple different, I don't know, different icons or lighting choices or what have you. And uh, and drew from that stuff and turned it into something completely different. And so I think once you start identifying that early stuff, stuff like Nosferatu, you see that influence. I mean, you see it everywhere. No, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think that inadvertently they came up with what would always stand as, and they say it in the film, the most realistic vampire movie or vampire story. So I'm sure everybody's aware of it now. And we cover, We did a vampire-centric show mm-hmm. uh, with Let the Right One In and Interview with the Vampire. And we went out of our way, we should point out now, to never really mention Nosferatu right. or talk about it that's at all. That's true. Because that's just not a conversation uh-huh. anybody was ready for at the time. And the thing is, is nowadays, and we've, we touched on it at nauseum in that show, but nowadays vampires are dumb and they're full, well-rounded human beings with sharp teeth. And you go to school with them. Now, uh, yep. that's what's going on in 2011. High school prom with a vampire. Yep, right. Okay? In 1920, you couldn't tell if they were human. Right. In the 20s, when Nosferatu came out of that tunnel, it wasn't, oh, I want that guy could be creepy. That yeah, guy right. might be a vampire. We'll need to see if he can fly. Right. It was... That thing is wrong. Yeah, Get right. that away from me. An abomination. I know that that is the devil okay. incarnate yeah. by looking at it. Right, And right. as for some reason, as we've moved forward in time, vampires have become more human. Why? I don't know. Things like Frankenstein's monster can never become more human. And that's the strength of those kind of things. Mm-hmm. The wolfman and the mummy are always scarier when you can't talk to them, yeah. when you can't reason with them, when you can't happen to discover that, oh, they had a long lost love. and They're still the things from the silent era. Exactly. I mean, Frankenstein wasn't always that way. Frankenstein got a little chatty in, yeah. the, <laughs> in the later days. But yeah, they're still the same silent guy from the silent era, despite the fact that everyone around them is t- talking all the fucking time. The thing is with Nosferatu is that he shows up, he shows up in that archway and it's not a question of who this is going to be a scary situation it's that thing wants your blood if you don't give it your <laughs> blood it's going to kill you there's no options it's not maybe i can rationalize a way that we can live in kind of a cohesive happy sure. existence here it's that thing will kill you get away from it that's why vampires now are the lamest fucking girly bullshit that you can put in a movie whereas in the 1920s I would shit my pants <laughs> right. seeing a vampire like that. Although, you know, there are exceptions. We talked about Let the Right One In. Sure. And how it was very obvious that they were vampires. And we had more of that human side of that. But we had to go through decades of shitty modern vampire movies to get something, you know, of that caliber. We had to try it in so many different ways before that came around. When the easier way is it's a creature, it's a monster. And it's fucking terrifying looking. I mean, that doesn't hurt either. It's it's funny to talk about a lot of that stuff because I know we always invoke Jaws as don't show the monster. And that was a criticism of Nosferatu at the time. So even before Jaws was ever around, the idea of don't show the monster, I mean, we're talking back in the fucking 20s. Mm-hmm. People are saying, you know, if we saw the monster a little less, those scenes worked really well. The scenes, uh, the infamous, you know, walking up the stairs yeah. shadow scene. Or And that's something we got to give Willem Dafoe a lot of credit sure. for here is that, 
you know, there are moments when he's doing the exact, he's repeating those icons from the movie. The death scene is a really mm. good example. That one hand in the air. And we see, you know, sort of a, a fake version of that, which seems to have a little impact, but we see the real death at the end. Yeah. And that hand goes up and it's this, this icon from the movie. The thing that Willem Dafoe is really great at is that he is, has so become that character that we feel like things that he does in, in this movie, in Shadow of the Vampire, are icons, even though they never existed previously. There are moments where he's playing with his hands, where he's looking up from his brow, mm-hmm. where we think to ourselves, oh, that's an iconic moment from Nosferatu, but that never actually fucking right. happened. That was never in the movie. Mm-hmm. You just believe he's that character so much. You know, there's stuff like you mentioned that, um, that archway. You know, the archway in the original movie, you could really see the vampire. Mm-hmm. You could clearly see his shape and his fucking weird head in his ears and his fingernails that were super long and that way he walks and the, the goddamn iconic shoulder pads. You know, that whole expressionist, weird, thin frame thing. Mm-hmm. You could see that there. And when we get delivered that in Shadow of the Vampire, it's not the same at all. Right. He's hiding in the shadows. We get an outline, but we feel the impact by the way everyone around him is behaving, and they've built up to him so much at this point that even though we're not just recreating you know, frame next to frame what the movie looked like, we, we still feel it. We absolutely mm-hmm. feel it. And so when there's scenes that don't even take place in the context of being, being shot, right? when there's scenes like uh, the morphine overdose scene, and he's sort of creeping around, and you see his shadow. Yeah. You see his hands. That feels like something out of Nosferatu, right. even though it doesn't take place, you know, in, in the story at all. So one last note that we're going to kind of touch on to kind of take us out of, <laughs> let's take ourselves out of, hey, Nosferatu, let's talk about, and we'll talk about actual Shadow of the Vampire in brevity here. Right, right. And I think the best way to do that is to touch on the one actor that we didn't talk about yet. That has to be Udo Kier. Yeah, it's Udo Kier. So Udo Kier plays, he plays the producer in this film. We never get to talk about him. I feel like he has to have shown up in yeah. movies before. Well, he was in, we saw him on the show previously in Halloween. He's in the oh, director's cut of Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yeah. Which if, okay, so I know we talk about the infamous Robert Cummings. If you're an actor in a Rob Zombie film, you have some cred. Yeah, you right. You have a horror background. You're an interesting person to discuss on, say, a show where two fucking idiots from Chicago talk about right, films for Right, exactly. Hour. And Udo Kier is, he's one of the older greats. He's not as far back as, say, Bella Lugosi, but he's up there. He's around the same era as, you know, later Christopher Lee. He did, he played his hand in a bunch of old kind of Hammer-esque horror films and a bunch of old monster movies, and he just, he did his time. Right, well, he was um, Hexen. I right. mean, the in the 70s, Mark of the Devil, not uh, Hexon, the, the 1922 Swedish thing. Right. Which is also hip. But yeah, he did that, and I mean, you know, there was another Dracula thing, there was Blood of Dracula, yeah. there was a couple vampire things. He was things. a big-time Dracula guy. Um, Suspiria, vampire. which I know we mentioned yeah. before, and that he was, I remember when I was younger, he was in this uh, this fucking corn music video. And I remember them talking about, you know, how excited they were to get this guy. And I was just thinking at the time, I've never seen him. And then recently seeing him, you know, in Grindhouse, in the official Grindhouse pair up Mm -hmm. in one of the trailers, of course, for Werewolf Women of the SS. But a very extensive collection, uh, back catalog of all sorts of exploitation films, horror films, just, you know, through the last... I maybe even only four or five decades. Yeah, probably maybe three or four decades Mm -hmm. and a ton of stuff appearing all over the place. Sure. Just as awesome in every fucking piece of it. So yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting Testament to put one of the old vampire actors in a new film about the first vampire, you know, it's right. Right. He is the, he is the meat to the vampire sandwich. Yeah. That we have in shadow of the vampire. Well, and also really makes you believe where they're at, where they're filming that kind of, um, you know, John Malkovich isn't going to bring that, and the dude from The Princess Bride is clearly right. not going to bring that. And Willem Dafoe is a scary motherfucker and busy doing his own thing right now. Yeah. So, he's you know, not, he's not there to nail down, hey, look, we're in Eastern Europe. Someone has to come along and be the goddamn mood and tone yep. that I keep talking about. And that man is definitely Udo Kier. Bravo. That was the best fucking show we've done all week. So, doublefeatureshow.com is the site. There's a Facebook where you can talk to other people who listen to this program because there mm-hmm. are actually other people who listen to this right. at this point. And the email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. 
Um, what else goes here? So we have this donation thing right. going on where if you go to donate.doublefeatureshow.com and you send us money, you will be entered into a random drawing. Then two people will be chosen and you get to send us a list of any fucking amount of films you want to as long as it's more than like four. And then we're going to choose one from each list, pair them together, do a absolutely awful show with it, and make it seem like we loved every minute of it. That'll be for the year-ender thingy that we typically do something with Jews and something with Tank Girl. And then after that, we're still going to do our look back on the year and don't mm-hmm. actually do any work that week show. Yep. It's a lie. That show is more work than any of the other ones. We have to look up lists and yeah, stuff. That's a homework There's show. A lot of that's filing. all homework. And especially with our producer being such Here a jagger. Here we show, like, a show, a show like today, or especially a show like next week, we show up and watch a bunch of movies, do nothing, eat popcorn, talk about... We're barely even paying attention by the end. I can guarantee you by the end of next week, we will be oh, barely paying attention. We, we just, we chat and we have a great time. And then we talk about how great of a time we had. But then now we have to talk about all the great times we had. It's kind of like a clip show without actually the ease of using old clips. From it's our a stupid idea, show. but I'm so married to the format now. And just once a year, it's good to rehash all the same bad film review jokes. Yeah. Speaking of married to the format, we have one of those things that our oh, fans shit. will not let go coming up next week. Whatever. You know you fucking love I absolutely things. love doing them, and I'm glad. But this is the hard one this, this year, This is the right? hard one. So we, we kind of... We, we got a Killapalooza. We have a Killapalooza. Up. For the previous Killapalooza this year, we did four films. Mm-hmm. Because it's difficult to find films that there are five of. Yeah, and that show is still an hour and a half fucking long, yeah so it was fine so but what we're doing is we're actually going to do a big grinding children of the corn-esque eight film show we're going to make up for all the slacking off we did on that's the last right show. so we're going to do a series of films we're going to do eight films that are about architecture in the american northeast oh called the amityville horror ah fuck and uh, not all of them are about architecture in the American Northeast because one of them in the eight films is actually about a dollhouse. But we're, don't worry about that. One thing we're not going to do, and this is important because when we did Halloween, we did Rob Zombie's Halloween, at the remake of the whole franchise, the reboot, whatever you want to call sure, it. Sure, and we hit that on Texas Chainsaw as well. It, absolutely. But we have decided that Michael Bay remakes of horror are in a different category than our slasher interests. Sure. So we're not going to do the Ryan Reynolds 2K version of Amityville Horror. Yeah, no, fuck that movie. We're going to do the original eight all the way from 79 to 96, and you are going to do it with us, you podmanious bastards. So watch more fucking film. Bye. Hold booms, which there weren't, but, you know, if this were a real movie, uh, they would be holding booms. They hadn't invented a stick with a microphone taped onto it yet. Way to go, 1920s. (laughs) Keeping it real. Maybe we should crank our cameras a little faster (laughs) to go in slow motion. (laughs) Oh, composure, composure.